Well, thank you, Travis, and thank you for Star Loco of inviting movies over on the stage. Um, I hope I don't bore you. Uh, my name is Lu Chen. Um, I have been in the commercial real estate world for, depending on how you count it, um, working-wise, more than 10 years. Um, I did uh, study commercial real estate um, from another 10 years ago. So I have been in this field for quite some time. But this session today, um, just learning from this morning, from panel, from all your great, brilliant ideas, I have to say I personally learned a lot. It's very inspirational. Um, and hopefully this afternoon session wouldn't bore you because I will be talking some hard data. And I, ha I do have to apologize. I couldn't get your green logo into my presentation slides because this one has 100 megabytes with linked data and stuff, but I try to make it more visual appealing. If you couldn't see anything on the slides, that's intentional because I didn't want you to see it. I'm going to tell the story, which is more important than the data. So let's go. If you haven't finished your dessert, uh, your yummy lunch, just keep doing that. Um, if you do feel drowsy, um, I think we have uh, iced tea on the table. So <laughs> feel free, make it comfy, OK? Um, didn't bother getting the agenda because literally the first half I'm going to talk about the macro economy and the second half is self storage. Uh, I swear, nothing more than that. Uh, economic trends and forecast. So some positive news, 2022 ended on a positive note. So this chart, um, I think I didn't specify, which is also intentional. This is the real GDP growth on the quarter over quarter basis for United States. Uh, if you pay attention, of course, everybody knows what has happened in 2020. But if like people like me live on a short memory, you probably forgot in the first half of 2022, we have two consecutive quarters with negative GDP growth. And that's where many media outlets started saying, we're cheerleading our ways into a recession because two quarters of negative GDP growth is usually a good indicator of a recession. But guess what? We flipped the sign. So the second half of 2022, we grew positively. Um, on a fourth quarter to fourth quarter growth perspective, US real GDP grew 1% positive. On the annual growth basis, that's 2.1%. Take it with a grain of salt because in 2021, that same rate was nearly 6%, because you probably all remember what has been going on after that V-shaped recession and quick recovery, which really boosted that growth of 2021 on an annual basis. Uh, what is driving us to end 2022 with a positive note? Consumer spending, um, I'm pretty sure many of us sitting on the table today has been spending extra in the restaurant, on your leisure travel, resumed business travel. So thank you all for spending your money to save our economy. Uh, real personal income growth has been staying positive, although that pace has slowed down quite a bit towards the end of last year, which is a good sign the Federal Reserve really like to see. They don't want to have that wage inflation spiral. Inflation high, you have to pay your worker higher, and then inflation is getting filled up, and you have to pay even higher. Once we get into that spiral, it's a bad thing. And from the latest FOMC meeting, and Federal Reserve um, Chair Jay Powell clearly said, we did not see any sign of that. So let's hold down too tight um, on this real personal income growth. Inventory growth in the last quarter of 2022 popped. So that literally struck the balance and saved the GDP, real GDP growth to be positive. Although you see that bar is getting shrink a little, but it's mainly because we are seeing this consumer spending, which is not as strong as in the third quarter or earlier in the year. Um, the personal income growth was moderating, but really that inventory growth, which was really inspired by the consumer spending, but also uncertainty facing how we are going to spend in 2023 is making that inventory grow extra big. Um, so that's 2022. But people have been puzzling. So depending on which side you are standing, there are conflicting signals on are we going to enter a recession? If there is a recession, would it be deep and profound or would it be shallow? Would it be less significant as 
um, the COVID, so the shaded areas, um, I have to introduce the chart a little bit. The shaded areas are recessionary period. So would it be as bad as COVID? Would it be as bad or even close to the great financial crisis in um, about a decade ago? So uh, there are conflicting signals. This one is commonly quoted. It's inverted yield curve. So now get your attention away from this chart. Let me introduce why we care. So usually if you put your money into your banking, into your saving account, so would you be getting higher return if that's a 10-year fixed rate? Or would, it be getting, would you be getting a higher return if that's one year? Usually it's 10 years because you deserve to be rewarded more if you are willing to pay, sp uh, save your money in your banking account. That's because if you look forward 10 years from now, you are subject to higher risk. Higher risk, higher return. So that's the rule of thumb. But when you have that interesting sign where the short-term interest is higher than the long-term interest, that's suggesting something in the near term is risky. And it's so risky that it usually can be considered as a leading indicator. So usually when we see the sign flip, that's where you see this dipping down the water. So we have a couple of instances which inevitably all associated with a near-term recession. So the com bubble, great financial crisis, and the COVID recession. So the, it usually leads to recession by somewhere between 10 months to 20 months, on average 15 months. And this dipping water um, towards the end of 2022, actually started middle 2022, get people really worried. So are we going to enter a recession? Let's look at the next one. Business sentiment, consumer confidence has been slumping. Um, it really started off since the beginning of 2022. And when the summer hit around July time frame, everybody was really gloomy about how the economy was. And remember that's when we just started getting the first quarter of negative GDP growth. And people were very cautious about their spending, they were cautious about their saving, they were cautious about their jobs. So there are many different reasons for people to concern. But ultimately, when the inflation inevitably was also taking up around the same time frame, that got people even more worried. Because as consumer, as you and me, I care about inflation. I'm pretty sure you care about that too. So that really plays an important role in driving your consuming behavior. So that is also a good indicator of how um, this self-fulfilling prophecy going to eventually lead us into a recession. Because if you expect a recession going to come and you regulate your spending behavior, and that eventually can lead us. I remember that consumer spending was a main driving force for the positive GDP, and it can cause the effect of a real recession. But some rule. So not sure if you are familiar, but Sam, uh, Sam Ru was named after an economist with the last name of Sam. So she said, usually, if you really look at the unemployment rate, if you are looking at, a, okay, this is a little um, jargon, economic jargon. If you look at the three-month moving average, if the unemployment rate is taking up on an average basis half a percentage point, as compared to the lowest unemployment rate in the past 12 months, and that's a clear indicator, we will enter a recession. It hasn't failed. And look at that indicator. So this is where we are towards the end of 2022. It's roughly just along that zero line, and there was no sign the labor market is softening. And we're still in this very, very tight labor market, and that is our best bet in today's economy. Because if you look at the inflation, if you look at the short-term risk, and everything was pointing, there is a very narrow path, but it's not an impossible path. We might avoid recession altogether without people losing their jobs, but bring down the goods inflation and bring back to the target. It might take longer time, but it's not impossible. So this is our best bet. And guess what? Earlier this week, I got a smiley from IMF. They have just updated 2023 World Economic Growth. 
The latest one is showy. I call it a smiley. I hope you agree with me, and I hope I wake you up because this is something I hope you can take home with. So, uh, real GDP growth, uh, the world 2022 ends with 3.4% uh, percentage growth. 2023 will be slowing a little bit, 2.9%, but it's not negative. And then it'll take up in 2024, which is forming that beautiful smile. Um, if you look at United States, you might start questioning me. Um, Lou, you just said smiley, but I don't see a smile. I see a smirk. Um, I do not blame you. And also, this is because 2.0 is a is somewhat higher number for us. So it'll be a little challenging for us in 2000, uh, 2023 and 2024. But it's not bad. We're not projecting anything negative. So there is a positive note from IMF when they are examining the world economy and they are adjusting upwards their projection. And why this matters? Because when everybody is talking about the globalization, we are nowhere close to the globalization. So just as in the morning we talk about the technology from Australia, when we are talking about collaborating from team around the world, I do not see the globalization. So ultimately, while our important trading partners are doing good, we will be doing good. So I want you to carry home with this positive note that consumers are resilient. Um, China seemingly is reopening and the fight for inflation started to pay off global-wise, not just U.S., because when you are talking about the imports and exports, when the Europe is assuming it doesn't have this very benign winter time, we might be in an even more difficult situation than today. And that brings me to the next slide, which means we still can have many things go wrong. <laughs> We're just going back and forth, see them way. Um, so on the horizontal axis, this is the severity of the risk. And on the vertical axis, that's the likelihood of the risk, which puts us if by any chance, you do not want to have anything happen in the top right corner over there. So financial system instability, debt ceiling, Federal Reserve missteps, housing price crash, US-China tension. So you don't want to have any of these. Um, you could Okay, don't take my words. Do not write down or record. Um, but climate change is relatively having smaller severity of risk. And the likelihood of having a climate change, significant climate change is also small. So it's less important, but it's important. So if it happens on this chart, it's important. Just so much less important than many other things which can go wrong. So at the end of the day, our economics department does try to put numbers on the map. Um, I didn't even bother putting out the actual percentage on the map because I know you can't see, especially after eating that delicious chocolate cake. Um, so the color coding, so this is the first time we're going to show a map. and You will be seeing the US map a couple more times. So anywhere you see a darker color, that means higher value or higher probability. If you see a lighter shade, that means nah, it's less important, okay? Um, so over here, uh, United States on the left-hand side is in that yellow zone. That puts us somewhere a little higher than 50%, so 50 to 65% probability of entering a recession. And even if that happens, now you can take my word seriously. I think it's going to be mild and shallow. It's go not going to run for too long. It wouldn't hurt the economy dramatically like the great financial crisis. There's just no way, especially, um, I think I have a separate slide, but I do hard remember um, today's Friday job number. Um, we added 157,000 jobs, and the unemployment, unemployment rate stayed little changed at 3.4%. If anybody have your smartphone, you can check on the number. Let me know if I remember the number wrong. But as a senior economist, I think that's part of my job. <laughs> but feel free. This is the digital world. And um, on the right-hand side corner, there is a big red. I wouldn't comment on it because I don't think the company allows me to say anything. But it's a combination of the political decision and economic choice. So let it, let's put it that way. So that's already in recession. Uh, Europe is having, Europe and Canada is having much higher 
chances of entering the recession because they are facing a multitude of different challenges than us. Um, okay. What to watch? I'm tr now trying to make the world super rosy. Uh, I am based off in San Francisco, and the tech layoff is uh, slashing on my face every single morning. So my neighbors, um, their companies are getting laid off, and the layoff um, scale are magnificent in, in many, many cases. Uh, many of the workers are very skilled, very experienced, and I, what can I say? If you have to earn so much, then sometimes it's time to take a pause. No, don't take my words for that. Um, so although we are having uh, so many laying offs happening uh, around where we live or maybe in the neighboring states, uh, which didn't make a huge splash, and why is that? Not because I'm from the Bay Area, I could represent the entire labor market. So this chart is the job opening uh, versus every single unemployed person. So at the peak, so you have to notice anywhere around the top right corner is something historic. Because if you put everything in the past uh, two decades, this is the level we have not seen. So at middle of 2022, last year, for every unemployed person and who's willing to take on a job, there are two job openings waiting for them. So I heard many of you sitting on the table today and seeing how competitive the job market is and how difficult to try to retain your employee and trying to recruit. And I get it. Why? Because they have so many options. And the turnover rate was high because if they turn over and they might get a fatter package, so that explains part of, part of the reason why the labor market has been so challenging. Um, right now, it has slipped off that peak a little, so you might not have to wait for an entire two hours at McDonald's for your meal to be ready. So it's probably down to 30 minutes. Sorry, I don't eat McDonald's, so I don't know. Um, so right now, it's 1.7. So for every unemployed worker, they have 1.7 jobs waiting for them. It's either one or two, I mean. it's just number. Uh, doesn't mean anything. It, it slid a little, but still, we are in that historic level, um, which is a very tight market. So tech layoff, yes, it's significant. It's probably not doing my neighborhood good. I'm seeing 20% slashes in housing prices in many of the expensive neighborhoods, um, which also means it's an opportunity when people are moving, and they probably inspire that demand in certain regions. So it's all about that macroeconomics. But uh, overall, if you look at nation in general, we're still in a pretty good shape. And the other thing is inflation. And this is the other chart I borrowed from my colleague. And I hope you can take home uh, with you today. Um, inflation is like getting toothpaste out of the tube. It's very easy to get out. But try to put it back in, it's messy. And why we're in this situation? Because you and me, the average American people, are having too much savings and income. I'm not saying we individuals have too much income. I certainly don't. But I'm just saying on average, we are seeing historic balance sheet um, for the standard American household. Um, and if you think about how challenging the supply chain was, um, I'm pretty sure you probably get this as me because I personally lived through a home renovation project myself. It started from end of 2020. I lived through 2021, failed. Um, I uh, relived the whole situation starting the early 2020. I'm still living it. Um, and the reason I'm failing is because I literally have to wait for everything to deliver to my door after five months. Um, if you order the wrong window, sorry. You're doomed. Um, you have to wait for another half year to get your window delivered. I wasn't even joking. Yeah, so it requires a better management skill than managing your wedding because there's little thing can go wrong with your wedding, but there are many, many things can go wrong with construction. So, um, and also, uh, I'm not sure if I use the correct jargon. Um, so for the framing of my house, I have to use the two bys. They call it two by, which is really two by two, but Anyway, um, so it used to cost $2 per piece, and then at the peak, I think it's 7 or $8, only if you're lucky. Oh. So if you have that good relationship and you have the contact at the lumber yard, you might get it. But if you are willing to pay $10, guaranteed, it's yours. So that's where we get this whole inflation spiraled up. Um, and it's why it's so difficult is when we track the apartment data 
and sorry, that was an accident. Um, when we track the apartment data, at the peak, you are seeing double digit year over year growth in many of the hot places. Um, sorry, the hot it has dual meanings. So the hot places in the Sun Belt region and also the popular places people really enjoy. Uh, so many New Yorkers, they move. Um, I'm sorry, I, I cannot represent New Yorkers. My colleagues can. But uh, keep me honest here. I think many New Yorkers decided to vote using their feet, and they uh, moved to Texas, Florida. A majority of them quite enjoy Florida, um, which created uh, some very interesting opportunities for the self-storage and, of course, the housing sector overall. And that fueled up the inflation because the shelter inflation is such a good, important component in the overall employ uh, CPI reading. And the latest rating still point, uh, the shelter inflation is lowering, but it's still high, 7.1. So the overall, uh, all goods and services CPI by the end of 2022 is 6.5, but the shelter inflation is still up per 7 percentage point range. And that is extremely sticky. So if you think the wage is going to be sticky, the shelter price is also sticky. I'm sorry, you just can't move every other month. If you live in Florida, I would imagine you're going to live there for a good number of months until you decided to move back and forth because there has been people going back and they got tired of New York and they moved back to uh, Florida. I guess all this is good. When people are moving, it's a really good opportunity for the self-storage. We'll talk on that later because this is really fitting into my interest of migration and housing market in general. 20 minutes. Um, do you want to just fly through this? Anybody care about this good thing is bad thing, bad thing is good thing? OK, nobody cares. <laughs> OK, um, projection. So crystal ball, I, I don't have crystal ball, uh, crystal ball. Mark Zandi has. Um, so this is what his team put up. The CPI, we already picked uh, at 8.6% on an annualized basis. And that should go down uh, depending on which scenario you're looking, because I'm looking at the grain, although I know the grain is hidden there. So that will bring us to a slightly above 2%, 2 percentage target for a little longer, but eventually it will stabilize. 10-year treasury. Um, I don't want to steal the show because I know there is a wonderful speaker after me who's going to talk extensively on the capital market. So um, we are projecting another few rate hikes for this year, although the still going to be much smaller. So collectively, we have increased the federal fund rate by 4.5 percentage point since March 2021. So it's less than, it's about 10 months we raised that much. And we're expecting the next few rate hikes, well, using Powell's word, next couple. I don't think he really meant couple, but some people take couple as two. Um, so would it be smaller in the scale as this week? So it could be a quarter percentage point. Um, and there was no indication we are going to catch rate in 2023. But again, I'm not Powell, so I can say whatever my crystal ball uh, tells me. Okay, so why is this all important for the core sector? Um, I know this is a very wordy page. Um, you can look at me. Do not look at the slides. Uh, I will read it out for you. Um, so higher interest rate is having multiple impacts on the commercial sector in general. So the higher financing cost, uh, the lower number of transactions, the, uh, the value depreciation. I don't think that's a, ever a factor in the self-storage sector, but apparently it started to hit other commercial sectors, including office and, I hate to say that, but a certain part of multifamily, because when you see the cap rate is increasing while your NOI stayed relatively stable in many cases, that suggests the value depreciation. Did I swear I, I'm not going to do math today? If I haven't said that, I'm, I'm good. Okay, so yeah, I didn't mean to throw out numbers there. Um, recession means the decreased wage and employment growth, and that'll slow the household formation. So that's very important because we're already seeing a moderating of the household formation. And household formation, sorry, I should explain. Household formation is how many households we're forming because usually you see the population changes. The household is how many households we're having. So say I live with Mary, my colleague sitting at the corner quietly there, um, if we used to be roommates and we are under the same household, but if 
age permits, or if um, the wage permits, and we decided to split, by, uh, split it up into two separate apartment units, we are forming individual households. So that's how the household can be formed and split. So although the population didn't change between Mary and me, but we have successfully doubled the household. Uh, household can also form by um, marriage, by uh, you no longer living in your parents' couch. Um, sorry, I speak for Gen Zs. Uh, <laughs> I'm not, sorry. Um, so all these things means a lot for uh, the multifamily sector in particular. And of course, multifamily sector has a strong correlation with the self-storage because people move, people form household, all these things matter. Uh, it also reduced demand for spaces for other core sectors, and which is also something we are closely watching because if you have the tech layoff, if you have the corporation being flexible with their space and they have to store their office supplies and belongings somewhere. So that's where we think uh, in many cases, and you could disagree because I do want to learn and hear, um, I think self-storage sector to a large extent is recession proof. It usually performs much better than many other sectors. And the reason I pause is because it's not always linear. It's not always monotonic. There are many other things which can derail the good path for us. I will hold, bear with me for two minutes, and I will get there. Uh, bigger fear, um, people have been talking about stagflation. I personally have not lived in the stagflation. Um, I don't know how that feels, but there is a definition, um, I think. Maybe you can uh, you can reflect how that would feel like. And uh, Mark Zandi has created a new terminology called slow session. Uh, it's not a recession; it's just slowing economy, and it shouldn't be hurting us as hell. But um, it's something we are fear of. And uh, I try to get fancy. Um, I try to get fancy of plotting uh, different commercial sector with the self storage asking rent growth. And you don't have to care about all other colors because I try to highlight self storage uh, with a orange red. Um, I, I do have clients complaining they couldn't quite differentiate the blue and the greens. Uh, but I have so far no people complaining differentiating uh, on orange, so we're good. So the orange, uh, if you look at, uh, our data goes back to about a decade ago, and of course we are looking for opportunities of expanding the data set and making it richer. Uh, if you're interested, I have my wonderful um, colleague, uh, Mark Ciccarelli. Did I pronounce that Italian right? Perfect. Thanks. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I try hard. I, I have been practicing in my dream. Um, so... <laughs> So he has, uh, he's our data expert, and he is working with uh, Store Local on uh, that uh, switch, the flip. Maybe you can say that better yeah. than me. That, 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 that switch, the flip, that you yeah. can, uh, we can start getting the data, the yeah. actual tenant data. But otherwise, uh, we have the data from the phone survey, property management survey, uh, web inquiry, and many great contribution coming from Store Local. Um, so far. So it's a combination of collaborative uh, workforce that allow us to bring data back to uh, the uh, early 2010s. And you can see we follow similarly the economic trend. But you will notice the yellow, sorry, the orange line uh, deviates a little. So the reason I will explain in later slides is because of the interesting battle between the supply and demand. If you have a very matured market, like apartment and office, and then you will clearly see they share the same peak and trough instantaneously. But self-storage, if you look at what has happened, I think that's a perfect segue into what has happened from the supply and demand leading to the COVID crisis was that, I call it a seesaw. I'm not sure if you see it. Um, but as a kid, I really like playing seesaw. So uh, 2017, 18, and 19, and it's really busy. I could plot it earlier, but that was when we see excessive supply, which is uh, the blue. I, I hope you can actually differentiate because some of my clients, they couldn't differentiate. So the left bar is the supply. The right bar is the demand. So that's when we have built up excessive inventory in the marketplace. 
And of course, this is overall national level. I'm not saying every region, every metro has the same situation, but overall we are seeing oversupply and that jack up the vacancy. So vacancy is the grain. And if you see solid, that's what has happened uh, based on our data. If you see dots, that's projection. And for many, many years, we have been waiting for this moment that something magical gonna fall on our head. And it happened. So in, two, in 2020, when COVID hit, uh, when people started to think about their dwelling option, when they started moving from north to south, when they are moving from where they work to where their parents live, when they started to form a new household with their friends and families, that created excessive demand for us. Yes, we have been waiting for so many years for that moment to happen, and it happened. So that's where you see the seasonality has gone for two years from us. So 2020, especially the later half of 2020, uh, most of part in 2021, we're not seeing the traditional seasonality which plays a very important role in the self-storage. So that's why people, I, I think that's a strong argument, self-storage is recession-proof, but also you have to keep in mind the supply and demand and what has happened in years leading to that great migration Ah, I love that term, uh, it just created. The great migration happens in the later half of 2020. You see a whole bunch of people leaving, emptying uh, the urban core. So from San Francisco, gosh, the entire street is empty. If you think of the mama and papa pulling their laundry bag on the street, they're all gone instantaneously. Um, and people move to more spacious area, low tax, warmer weather. And then they quickly got tired of it. So when the employers are calling employees to come back and prepare for a return to work, of course it didn't really happen until recently, finally stabilized at about 50 percentage um, for the return to office rate. But people came back in preparation for that. So they migrate back. And then they realized, you know what, this is not really happening. We are in a whole different world. We are in digital now. So I can bring my laptop and work in the hotel, who cares? maybe my HR cares uh, for the tax payment perspective. And then people subtly, some of them migrated back to the south. May not be the same location, but you are seeing this interesting movement, people coming back and forth, um, which uh, seems to quiet down in 2022. That's where we see the seasonality returns. So I'm going to call upon Mary because I can't remember the number at this point. I have spoken for so many numbers. Do you remember what is the vacancy decline in the fourth quarter of 2022? 130 basis point. And what was the average for 2020 and 2021? Seven Only seven. And I have to introduce Mary Lee. Um, she's the golden finger uh, for our self storage and many other specialty sector uh, data. So it's her contribution who gather all the data points and being able to prepare something like this. So thank you. Um, the next one is the return of seasonality. Um, we see the ups and downs in uh, the later half of 2021, but the real seasonality returns uh, in the fall and the winter of 2022. And I, I try to make it a little obvious, but uh, Mary, could you remind us what was the quarter over quarter rent changes in the last quarter, 2022? Negative 2.1 for climate control. How about non-climate control? Non-climate control was negative 2.3. 2.3. And we're talking about 10 by 10. So that's close to what we have seen prior to COVID. So it's because the supply and demand both slowed and stabilized. We are in that equilibrium state that we are seeing the seasonal slowdown. It's nothing alarming. It's just a return of that seasonality. Um, I will not touch upon the dotted line because I have separate slides for that. Anybody care about regional? Should I just fly through? <laughs> because there wasn't anything peculiar about the regional. So what I wanted to share, or uh, wanted to explore earlier was the household formation and employment changes for different regions. But I also gather many of uh, the audience today have your regional and metro uh, operations. So I would save time for the metro level inside, okay? Okay, 
So this is another slide. You wouldn't be able to see the number. Um, on the left hand side is from US Bureau of Economic Analysis, um, BEA. And on the right hand side is the Census Bureau. So what I really wanted to bring to your attention is the economic growth for each and every single state on the map and also the population changes because they don't track the household formation as timely as we want to. Uh, Mark Zandi has his own projection on the household formation. I think I have a separate slide, but we have that data in-house. Uh, but just from the population standpoint, the ten, top 10 states in nu numerical growth from 2021 to 2022. So this is from July 1st, 2021 to July 1st, 2022, following their calendar year. Uh, Texas, Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, South Carolina, Tennessee, Washington, Utah, and Idaho. So these states have gathered the most increases in their population. And I hope that also is the driving force for the demand of self-storage units in those states. And if you plot these states on the left hand side and see their economic growth, and many of these places are also posing positive growth, I think all of them are, uh, which is a good indicator the economy is weathering through the multitude of different uh, difficulties and the challenges, and they have been going along, checking along, uh, while being able to cope with the increase in their population overall. So these are where the opportunity sits, um, as the latest data suggests. Um, as I promised earlier, uh, I made the number super small, so you either have to come very close and look at what the number says, or I try to col uh, color code them. Uh, you know, when I, my first impression while looking at this map, um, because I'm a very visual person, if you just have a bunch of data in front of me, I wouldn't make sense of it. So I was looking at the growing middle, because for so long we care about the Sun Belt, we care about the coastal cities and states, and we didn't really put a lot of eyes on the Midwest region. And I saw it really popped out with that darker color. So what's going on there? Uh, on the right hand side is the inventory growth and on the left hand side is the vacancy changes. And I realized even in the recessionary period, even the economy is suggesting we are all having a moderating of household formation, we are having challenges in certain sector, but these places have been growing their inventory significantly. And is it doing good for all these states? Is this because of the result of opportunities or is this creating problems? And then I realized for many of these darker uh, colored states, they are actually having an increase in self-storage vacancy. So that is the interesting battle you can see clearly when you have oversupply or a sudden increase of the supply shock. So how the local demand market is able to absorb or not being able to absorb that excessive supply. Um, but anyway, it's a good example, but I want to highlight California, Texas, Florida, New York, and Georgia accounted for nearly half of the inventory nationwide that we track. So as of today, uh, Mark can keep me honest, but I think we are close to 10 million uh, units in our database. So we are probably 200,000 shy, and we will get there in later part of 2024, or early part of 2025, but we're getting there. And the reason it takes us so long to get to that 10 million mark is really because the inventory is projected to growing much slower than the years leading to the COVID period. Uh, metro performance. Uh, I put top 15 metros from inventory perspective on this chart, and I hope I cover your metro, but if you don't, let me know. I'm okay to share uh, offline, off the stage, but just for uh, the majorities of interest. So I have Los Angeles, a whole bunch of Texas metros, I have New York, I have a whole bunch of Southern California metros on the chart, and this one is comparing where we are as of today, so we literally got the data the day before. So on the 1st of Feb is when we um, have the Q4 2022 data avail available. And uh, it shows unanimously all metros has been doing uh, either at the same level as pre-COVID or much better than uh, 2019. The Left bar, the green bar, is the total completion during the uh, 2020 to 20. So in the past three years, 
and the right bar, the uh, blue bar is the demand. So almost you are seeing uh, two thirds of the metros are having stronger demand than supply. So the couple of metros that did circle, uh, Houston, Dallas, San Bernardino, uh, Northern New Jersey, and Fort Tours is having a slight oversupply. I have to, um, I have to highlight its slight oversupply. And also considering many of the Texas metros, they have much lower bar for entry. So it's relatively easier to build out than some of the very tight markets. So um, I wouldn't be worried too much, um, but this is a supply demand story after all. And the rent, uh, this is also a very interesting comparison. Uh, the the, the blue bars are comparing today's rent with 2019 pre-COVID, and the green is year-over-year -year comparison. So all metros have, uh, most of the top 50 metros have exceeded their 2019 rent level, uh, with exception of Houston, I believe. And I was very intrigued by what's going on with Houston. Then I realized I was looking at the non-climate controlled, and their climate control units was doing significantly better. Uh, so if you look at from a holistic point of view, I would say all metro have exceeded their pre-pandemic level. And of course, for various reasons, right? We have lower vacancy, but we also have higher cost, higher labor expenses, which we have to compensate for. So there are many reasons which is driving that higher rent level. But last, compared with Q4 last year, uh, I wouldn't worry too much. So these are dollar amounts. Uh, if you see 1.6, which is $1.6 off. Uh, on the top line for tours. And remember, we are talking about the return of seasonality. So we are comparing the last quarter 2022 against a strong performing year in 2021. So that's why I would like to highlight the, green, the blue bar rather than the green bar, which is really showing that seasonal variation. Forecast, finally, last three slides. We are almost there at the finish line. Um, completion will not be as strong or significant as how we projected a quarter ago based on the data we have. So we lower the projection for 2023. It will relatively stay at that level because we do see some consolidation conversion going on. And supply is steady, which is good. Um, although we are having a slower household formation, but we're also dealing with some challenges on the corporate front. So. 2023-24 uh, um, uh, will be having steady demand regardless of the recession or not. And the dot on the very top is a projection of the vacancy at the national level. So we are projecting a slow but steady um, decline of vacancy overall. So there shouldn't be any surprises. Uh, but of course, every quarter when we have new data rolling, we'll fine adjust the projection. And of course, the more data we can work with, and uh, the more accurate our projection will hopefully be. Rent growth will decelerate, uh, but we are not projecting a negative growth on the annual basis. And this one, I know I try to go fancy, and sometimes it doesn't work the way I want it. But orange is the asking rent for climate control, and the gray is the non-climate control. But they usually follow along each other. Uh, the climate control usually varies a little more, but just marginal. So uh, it, it, in 2023 onward, we should see a steady increase, and there shouldn't be a dipping like um, uh, 2022 overall. I will stop at the very last slide because it also try we try to go into individual metros and project the uh, rent growth and vacancy changes. So this is a combination of different factors, including the supply, the demand, and uh, the current rent level. So I will park here uh, in case you want to take a closer look, or if you want to finish your dessert, this is a good time. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Why would non-climate control grow so much faster in Phoenix than climate control? This is mostly data-driven. Um, I, <laughs> I know. So the only one metro I do see the interesting um, 
extreme uh, growth is Houston. So I do see even Orange County is showing some nuanced differences between climate control and now, but it could be the existing stock between the climate and non-climate. Um, I think we have that granular data, but Mary didn't give that data to me. So I blame on Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you, Lou. Of course. Great job. Thank you.